Center, it's Peggy over here taking the pictures, Clara and Angela in the back. Uh, welcome, welcome, welcome. As much as a surprise as this is to me, next month will be our fourth year. Wow. And for those, yeah. And for those of you who have been following the song from the beginning, you have the bathroom in, <laughs> and it works. So I think you're, it's mandatory that you at least go look at it. You know. We're very, very pleased to start our programs for this year. Uh, I'm exceptionally pleased to start it with our author, Sean Ferreter, uh, who has his uh, two wonderful books he's going to talk to you about. Now, we ask your indulgence on this. When he is finished, please hold your questions till we brave the cold and get back over to the center, but we will have some hot coffee and <coughs> some light refreshments. And at that point, you can ask your questions, chat with each other, but we do ask that you let him get back over there so we can get him set up in the center. And I thought I would um, tell you something about Sean, but then I heard somebody ask him, to please tell something about himself when he started. So that's probably better, because I would probably just make up a bunch of stuff. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> he might too, but yeah, he's, yeah. he's entitled. It's his mm. stuff. Mm. So I want to welcome yeah. here Sean Ferrer. Thank you very much. I'm trying to get used to this microphone. Um, I was thinking about starting my presentation. Everybody says, well, you need to start with a joke. And I go, well, geez, I'm not sure if there's any real good jokes about writers and authors. But in my daytime job, I'm a lawyer. And there's lots of lawyer jokes. And so I was going to start out with my favorite lawyer joke of all time. Um, but you didn't hear it from me. What do you call a lawyer with a 50 IQ? Your Honor. <laughs> you do not tell that. And, I, and all the judges I've, I've known have terrific sense of humor, so at least knock on wood. Um, you know, I love writing. I love Nebraska. I love Nebraska history. When I was growing up in Ravana, I was so impressed with the land and the sky and the rivers and the history that we had. You know, in high school it seemed like history was something that occurred somewhere else. It was in Europe or it was on the East Coast. It really didn't seem to happen much here. But that is so wrong. It is so wrong. I love coming here to Dannenbrog. You know, because Dannenbrog seems to celebrate its Native American history and its ethnic heritage. And there are so few towns that do that and blend those traditions so well. You know, I feel really good that I'm living in Grand Island now. And I feel great that we've got so many different ethnic groups coming in, the Somalis and the Latinos and the Latinas. <laughs> and how that all comes and we cooperate and it just feels so good. But it wasn't always like that. And I remember I was in law school, that movie Dances with Wolves came out and you know I, I remember relating to that because that occurred in our own backyard. Those incidents were going on all the time. There was racial hatred, there was tribal hatred, there was ethnic hatred. And I started to really explore that. Now, I write historical fiction. You know, fiction's important part of that to remember because I can't get into my, the mind or, you know, know exactly what had occurred. But it just seemed like a rich um, genre to explore these things. And if someone reads my books and decides, you know, I really want to find out exactly what happened, that's great. That's perfect. They can get into the historian to make sure that everything is precise and everything is accurate. I believe my books show the spirit of the times. 
And I had so much fun writing them. They were just so fulfilling because they're about our home. They're about Nebraska. The first book that I did, of course, you know, I was talking about Dances with Wolves. And I remember seeing that program and the Pawnee were the bad guys. You know, they were presented as, you know, they were, the, they were going after the, the Lakota. And I thought, you know, there has to be a different side to that story. And there was. Um, the last major tribal conflict between Native American tribes occurred, uh, that occurred in North America, actually took place here in Nebraska. And it took place in what is now modern Trenton, Nebraska. It was the Battle of Massacre Canyon. And it was probably the most, it is the most um, decisive bloodletting that's ever taken place in Nebraska historically. More people died in that, in that instant that we have records of than you know, stark weather, and there's just been so many terrible things that's occurred since then. But that was a difficult day. It was a difficult day for the Pawnee. I wanted to learn about that. And I went, my wife and I went out to Trenton, and that is just such a mysterious territory. It just seems so ripped from the pages of history. You can look out onto the fields, and you can look out onto the canyons, you can look out onto the meadows, and you can almost see how Nebraska looked in the 1870s. It was August 5th, 1873, and a Pawnee hunting uh, expedition had gone to their territorial hunting grounds in the Republican River Valley. And they were confronted by a Lakota Sioux war party. Many Native Americans died. There was one white um, agent who was kind of designed as, or he was told to be an escort for the Pawnee. When, they, when the Native Americans um, would go on their hunting grounds, or they would be escorted by a white trail agent. And that was so that he could avoid conflicts with other white settlers, so that he could make sure that there was just some organization, and of course the Pawnee um, had their own old systems of organizing a surround, killing the buffalo and so forth, but they assigned one of the Indian agents to travel with him, and this gentleman's name was John Williams. He was a younger guy. He didn't know the territory as well as um, the white trail agents who had gone before. Many people blamed him afterwards. But I found him as a sympathetic character. First of all, he lived with the Pawnee. He interacted with the Pawnee. He learned their language. He developed a rapport with the tribal chiefs. The, um, the incident that occurred had a devastating impact on the Pawnee. They would be um, removed from Nebraska within three years of that battle. And many of the historical um, references of how the Pawnee were removed from Nebraska to what was then Indian Territory referred to this constant conflict this constant conflict with the Lakota. And Indian warfare was different than warfare with the whites. Warfare with the whites took a higher casualty toll 
But Indian warfare was constant. It was a low grade. Um, it, it was just something that they always had on the back of their minds. Um, the animosity that continued between these tribes lasted until the uh, basically the Great Depression. Um, there were still uh, very hard feelings between the uh, native, the Pawnee and the Lakota. But I had such a good experience with writing this book, I began to relate to the great Pawnee war chief and peace chief, Petala Shaharo. Petala Shaharo, there's um, a huge mural in the bank in Genoa, and it's got a picture of him. If anyone has gone into the, uh, I think the Genoa State Bank, they've got a huge mural, they've got the, the Pawnee village that had uh, been located in, um, in the area, and they have Petala Shaharo, and he is just such a tremendous figure that I had to put him in the book. He was sadly killed crossing the Loop River. I also found that kind of mysterious because no one really knew how he died. He felt that he had shot himself. What he had is he had a, a harness with a re revolver and he was trying to cross a stream that was swollen from rainwater. Um, you know, and whenever you're carrying firearms, accidents happen. Everybody knew that these accidents occurred. Somehow a gun was discharged. It wasn't really determined whether it was his gun, but a gun was discharged and he was shot crossing this river. Now there were Pawnee who felt that the white man had killed him because he was one of the most vociferous supporters of the Pawnee maintaining their lands in Nebraska. Many of the Pawnee felt that someone else could have killed him because he tried to make peace with the Sioux. There's just all kinds of conflicting issues and no one really knows, but he died you know, during this time frame and I included that within the book. The, um, the book was um, probably the greatest thing outside of raising Adam, of course, you know, my steps, helping to raise that. It's probably the greatest thing I've ever been able to accomplish in my life. I feel so good about it. It's just um, one of those things that, boy, I brought this thing into the world. This is something people can connect me with. Um, it was published by Ex Libris, and it is just one of these books that um, I can actually read it myself and not go, oh, geez, this author is an idiot. <laughs> I'll read you a portion of it. This is to set the scene for you. Two days before the Battle of Massacre Canyon, there are two um, Indian encampments. One is Pawnee, the hunting encampment, and one is the Sioux encampment. The Sioux are led by an Indian warrior by the name of Blue Storm. Blue Storm is based on a actual Lakota leader by the name of Little Wound. But this occurs August 1st, 1873. Blue Storm had no way of knowing. Newspapers as far as way to Denver and re Omaha would report the star showers, nor would he have cared. As he rode along the southern bank of Frenchman Creek and spoke with the night watch, he saw the brilliant flaming ball overhead. The great meteor fell from the western sky and momentarily lit up the landscape with daytime brightness. His eyes could still see the smoky trail for many seconds after the fiery orb disappeared, hundreds of lesser stars began to descend immediately after the trail evaporated into the darkness. 
Blue Storm and his companion stood long after the vision disappeared, staring up at the sky. It is a good omen, he said, to see a falling star from the west. The Pawnee will not return to the east after their destruction. Miles to the southwest, within the camp, the Pawnee had set up along Driftwood Creek. The meteor shower lit up the darkened sky. As their evening prayers were concluding, the great star blazed above their heads, and they began to ask themselves what could be its meaning. The following meteors were barely noticed and little remarked upon after the first spectacular show. All the braves concluded that the great meteor was for the remote one's dedication to Petala Shaharo. If they could have spoken to Lechela Shaharo back at the big village, they would have been filled with a sense of foreboding. He was dutifully at his evening prayers. He knew that the falling star indeed represented the death of the great chief. He had often spoken of these phenomena that were legendary among the Omaha, Pawnee, and Oto Indians. He knew the greater the apparition, the greater the warrior. The star shower that followed the great meteor had a meaning as well. He prayed for the safety of the Pawnee hunters as he watched the lesser stalls far. He knew at that moment the killing was not over. That's three days before the Battle of Massacre Canyon. And so that, I, I think that book turned out pretty well. After I was done with that book, I thought, you know, there's just so much to say here. There's just so much to explore. There's so much to look at. There's so much Nebraska out there that people don't know about. And so I started kind of looking about how Nebraska became Nebraska. When the Kansas-Nebraska Act was established, which was a legislative um, enactment that developed Kansas and Nebraska as territories, Nebraska was huge. It was massive. It went from the Kansas border all the way up to Canada, up almost to the, um, uh, the Little Bighorn Mountains. That was a massive area of territory. It was a federal territory. Of course, administratively, it was not organized by the local authorities. Local territorial Nebraska authorities were appointed by the federal government. They were all appointed by <coughs> The president, you know, the territorial Nebraska governors were appointed by the president. And their jurisdiction ran from basically Omaha to um, Central City, which at that time was called Lone Tree. And they had to design a state out of all this. And of course, the Pawnee were here. The Pawnee had been here for generations. And... Um, as Nebraska was developing, it had to obtain a certain population level. It had to obtain a certain political infrastructure. It had to develop all kinds of things that were within the legislative enactments to apply for statehood. And that's what these forefathers of the state of Nebraska were trying to do. First, they were trying to attract people. They were just saying, oh, Nebraska is a land of milk and honey. You can." They weren't quite saying you could pick gold off the street, but they were saying, oh, the, the weather is just fantastic. It never gets chilly. It, you, know, you can grow whatever you want. Just, <laughs> now, of course, they were wrong. As we know today, it gets chilly in Nebraska. But, but people came. Settlers came. There was a Homestead Act enacted. And it's kind of interesting that at the time, um, as I said, these governors were appointed by presidents in the Franklin Pierce and James Buchanan. They were Democrats. The Democratic National Party at that time was against the Homestead Act. And they had kind of sound reasons. When you look at it, 
um, the Democratic Party felt that homestead legislation, one, would cause friction and alienation amongst the Western tribes, which it certainly did. They also felt that, you know, the federal government is trying to attract immigrants, basically urban immigrants from Eastern Europe, from, you know, these countries that don't really have a rural agricultural tradition, certainly nothing compared to the land, the continental climate of Nebraska. And so they're attracting people to fail. They're setting up people so that the railroads can send out all these goods, all these shipments, and build their infrastructure um, subsidized on the backs of immigrants who really do not have much of a chance of making it growing crops in this climate, in this region, and so forth. You know, and you look at the final tallies, the Homestead Act, you know, the, the, the actual settlers who obtained their, their, um, their, um, their deed through the process was only a fraction of what could have, you know, had they had subsidies to, you know, feed and subsidies for water, subsidies for, you know, more support than what the Republicans, what the basically um, the Democratic politicians who saw the Republicans led by the railroad attorneys like Abraham Lincoln, they were trying to pour settlers out here so they could subsidize their progress. But studying all this stuff and all of the little conflicts going on within the state was just fascinating. And then you put the interactions with the <coughs> tribes in there, and it just is amazing. This occurred in 1859, which is just before the American Civil War. And the American Civil War was basically a sectional conflict about you know, slavery and free states. Um, there were a lot of issues that were going on south of the border in Kansas. There was a lot of violence in Kansas. And that was one of the things that the territorial governors wanted to avoid at all costs. They did not want a bleeding Nebraska. They wanted to keep out the radicals, and that meant both the abolitionists and that meant the um, people who wanted to bring slaves into the, into the territory. You've got all this stuff going on, and you've still got the Pawnee trying to survive. You have the Pawnee still trying to gather their, um, you know, their uh, meats and their hides and their food and raise their children and make sure that they've got homes and their villages and make sure that they're protected from both white encroachment and from other Native Americans that may do them harm. The Pawnee went on a hunting expedition and for whatever reason, I've got a theory in it in this book, depredations occurred. They attacked some farms, they attacked some villages. And the legislatures in the capital city, which was in Omaha, said, you know, something has got to be done. This can't go on. And whenever someone is saying something's got to be done, usually a bad thing is about to get done. And so they go, oh, we got to get the militia going. We've got to go up there and we got to punish these guys. And they did. They organized and they sent up the Nebraska uh, militia. The Pawnee were camped just west of what is now Norfolk, Nebraska, along a little creek. And today that 
that town, that creek is known as Battle Creek, Battle Creek, Nebraska. Um, it is a fascinating story in itself. I loved the characters in this. I particularly, I like this one, the, uh, the white governor of the state, Samuel Black. Um, he's kind of a hard drinking, uh, no nonsense type of guy. He did have some talent as a cavalry officer, but his drinking got the best of him. You know, back then, people don't know about issues with drinking like we do today. And um, I, I, I wanted to present Samuel Black's issues with alcohol as they would be addressed in the 1850s, not as we would be doing it. You know, I've kind of had my own issues with drinking. And one of the things that surprised me when looking at some of the, oh, the processes of, if somebody's got a drinking problem, they'd say, you know, it's not, the, you just can't drink so much. So it's kind of like a moderation management. And so there's a number of characters who are feeding him little bits of booze. You know, they know he's got a problem, but they're feeding him some booze because, you know, some of them are trying to get him through this issue, trying to get him through the problem. Some of them want him to be a drunken buffoon and completely incompetent so they can take advantage of it. So they have their own agenda. But he is just such a character in that, boy, I'm drinking, people are depending on me, I've got responsibilities, I'm governor of the territory of Nebraska, and I can't quit drinking. I can't quit drinking. And it's just that thought that, geez, I can't do this. Um, he doesn't end up well in this circumstance. It's really interesting, you know, they talk about, as they're marching up to confront these Pawnees about him being drunk and sending soldiers to get more booze and so forth, and all of that really happened. It really happened. It is an amazing story. It's the confrontation that convinced federal authorities, you know, the territory of Nebraska could organize for its own self-defense. So the Nebraskans got a good thing out of it. The Pawnee didn't. The Pawnee got sent to um, basically a reservation, which was a fairly good-sized reservation for back then, but still they could not wander, they could not hunt, they could not comply in their traditional ways. So from that point forward, the Pawnee were in decline and the state of Nebraska would be going forward. I love writing. I love Nebraska history. History occurs underneath our feet and it is so special to be able to look at a document and say, you know, no one has really explored where this document came from, or is this the true story? Because sometimes you hear, oh, Black was drunk in his tent today. Well, was he really drunk? Or, you know, I mean, it's just fascinating being a historian. If I could be a historian or an author and make a living at it, you know, being a lawyer, I'd just say, hey, the, writing these books, I don't need any more jokes told about me. I'd rather spend some time in the library. Um, I'm actually working on another book, and this is early. This is 1720s. This is, this is so early. This is like 40 years before the French and Indian War. And believe it or not, there were, there were white men, um, French and Spaniards, who were in Nebraska and they were contesting this land. And there was a big conflict, there was a big battle, the Villa Sur expedition, that came to a head in Columbus, Nebraska. France wanted to 
uh, France wanted to go from, you know, New France, which is up in Montreal, Quebec, go through Illinois, and connect with New Orleans through the Mississippi River. Spain wanted everything up to the Appalachians, and Nebraska's here. And so those two empires, which were, you know, world powers at the time, the, the American colonies, we were just huddled on the eastern coast, you know, scared of our own shadows. We had our own issues. It, the, the Catholics in Maryland couldn't get along with the Quakers in Pennsylvania, and there's just all kinds of issues going on with those guys. But out here in Nebraska, there were two large empires that were trying to gain a foothold, and there are also Native American people. And that is going to be my next story. You know, I love coming here. I can't... You know, this is a, a, a dream. I can't imagine being able to talk in front of people and have someone who has a street named after him <laughs> in the audience. Actually, my mother named me after the street. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was going to try to come up with a joke on that about how... I didn't know how the cavemen had uh, streets or, you know, but I'll leave that one. I'll just tell another lawyer's lawyer joke. This is about criminals. There's no one here who's a criminal. So we can, t why did the robber take a bath? He wanted to make a clean getaway. Well, I'll stick to writing. <laughs> You have been an excellent audience. This has been uh, fantastic. I love the Pawnee Art Center. Let's go back there, have some refreshments, look over all of the terrific items that they have for sale. You know, I couldn't believe I came up to visit and the president of the Pawnee Nation was sitting in here taking items out of boxes. And they've got, you know, just these magnificent Navajo mm -hmm. um, kachinas. kachinas, and there were pottery. pottery. It, it just look at the exquisite workmanship in that. I couldn't do that. That's just that's a talent beyond anything that I could imagine, and it's it's part of American heritage, and yeah. it is so terrific being here. Thank you for inviting me. Let's go back and enjoy the oh, right. art center. Okay. Oh, what a pleasure to have you back. <laughs> and I really want to congratulate everybody for, for um, getting through this um, March what is it, 2nd weather. Um, I know that we had several people that planned on coming and they were just afraid of the weather. But that was from Broken Bow. So mm -hmm. um, thank you so much for being here. And I do want to say that since we are having our fourth year anniversary, I think April 10th, um, I'm sure we'll do something. But it's been probably the most um, meaningful, exciting, four years of my life. <laughs> yeah. I had no idea, because um, my, my great-grandmother had come over on one of the Conestogas coming in from, from Denmark, and she crossed the loop. And so I'm like blood-related to what happened to the Pawnee. Mm. I've heard so many of the stories from the family, and I never never could go there, you know, what, what they did. Yeah. There was a, probably a young woman sitting out here, probably about where the tower is, and uh, somebody just shot her. Mm -hmm. uh, they might shoot a raccoon or something. And that broke my heart. And then um, in 93, I kind of got this feeling, I have to go home. Dan Abram, are you kidding? <laughs> <laughs> you know, no, I'm not going to do it. 
Well, I did, and within two weeks, I was, I was back here in Danabo. And now I know why. If you're where you're supposed to be at the right time, it's perfect. Yeah. It is so perfect, and um, we just now, this last week, got some vintage, antique, um, Indian artifacts, uh, belts, and moccasins, and I really hope you take a look at that. That's just the first I've ever been around. So we have a case of those, and um, I know that Gail made a couple cakes, and we got coffee, and so if I can get you to not mob Sean, I usually take him out this side door, <laughs> turn him over to the, um, the art center. But thank you so much for coming today. It really means a lot to us. You want me to announce what? Sure, thank you. <laughs> it's Sunday. Yeah. All right.